Good evening, everyone. I get, I'm not sure it's really worth waiting for this to stop. Uh, there are still some people who are trying to schedule their walk across the way here for the rain to stop. They may never make it. We, uh, we certainly needed this rain, but I don't think this much or right now. But we will do the best we can. Can people in the back hear me? OK, great. Uh, I'm Elliot Gerson, Executive Vice President of the Institute, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome all of you here tonight, and a special welcome to all of our guests listening on Aspen Public Radio. Uh, this is the first of our summer series of the McCloskey Speaker Series, and I want to give a special thank to Tom and Bonnie and their family for their generosity for supporting these talks. Uh, today, we are honored to have with us David Leonhardt. Uh, David is someone many of you probably already know, uh, not just because of his Tuesday columns in the New York Times, but because he's become really a great friend of the Aspen Institute. He appears regularly as a moderator in our programs, as he did this year at Spotlight Health and the Aspen Ideas Festival. Uh, but uh, many of you, of course, know him through his writings as well. Uh, after an early career in journalism at the Washington Post and Business Week, uh, he's been at the New York Times where his rise has been frankly uh, meteoric. Uh, he was the Washington bureau chief. He also was the founding editor of The Upshot, which is a feature I'm sure you're all familiar with, which focuses on issues of politics and policy and economics with a special emphasis on data and graphics, which aren't at all surprising, given the fact that David himself was a math major and brings enormous analytic integrity to everything that he does. He also, and this is very appropriate given the topic of tonight, has been really a visionary on the business side of, of the news business and has actually led the internal effort at the New York Times trying to determine the best way for the New York Times company to continue to succeed in the midst of this digital revolution that is shaking up the entire publishing industry. And of course, in 2011, David won a Pulitzer Prize for his commentary, a commentary focused on economic issues and especially the, the uh, fallout from the financial crisis. Uh, the Pulitzer Prize Committee noted, as I recall, his graceful writing about complicated economic issues. Uh, he's also authored the best-selling e-book, Here's the Deal, How Washington Can Solve the Deficit and Spur Growth. He's also been a friend of the Institute in other ways. He has been on the jury uh, for several years, if not since the inception, of the million dollar Aspen Prize for Community College Excellence. And finally, let me just make a pitch for those of you who just know him through his Tuesday columns. He also writes a daily uh, email newsletter uh, called Opinion Today. And if you don't get it, I please, please consider signing up for it. It's a remarkably insightful way to begin your day with commentary, not just about his own columns, about, but also about other columns, and remarkably, not just in the New York Times, but competing journals as well. So he really is one of the great journalists in the country today. What we're going to do this evening is a little bit of a hybrid compared to our usual moderated discussions. David is actually going to speak uh, at length, uh, and then I'm going to join him on stage, ask just a few questions, and as usual, leave questions for all of you at the end. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Leonhardt. Thank you, Elliot. What a nice introduction. Given all this rain, let's make a deal. If you can't hear me, if I'm not talking loudly enough, wave your hand, and I'll take that as a signal to talk louder. So thank you, Elliot. Thank you for that advertisement for the daily newsletter. I appreciate it. I've not yet written tomorrow's, so if anyone has ideas during the Q&A uh, session, I'll happily take it. Um, this is my ninth 
consecutive summer coming out here um, to be part of the Institute's programs, and it is always a treat to be here. It's particularly a treat tonight to, to talk about something that I have really spent the, much of my working life over the last five years or so thinking about, which is the future of news. So in addition to thanking Elliot, I wanted to thank Walter, I wanted to thank Jillian Scott, thank Bob Steele, um, who's responsible for this night, and everyone else at the Institute um, for arranging it. I also want to thank all of you for coming out uh, in what is not the, the best circumstances. Uh, thanks for getting wet to come out and listen. Um, so let me start by saying that I've been really struck by the extent to which American journalism has become the subject of intense interest over the past year. The level of interest is greater than at any point in my almost 25 year career as a writer and an editor. Journalists have alternately been blamed for Donald Trump's election and hailed as the saviors of our democracy, sometimes by the very same people. The president, for his part, has cast journalists as probably now his number one foil, the enemy of the people, in his disquieting phrase. Meanwhile, thousands, if not millions, of Americans have decided to support journalism in recent months by paying good money for new subscriptions to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and many other publications. This is a moment when people seem unusually interested in journalism. A couple weeks ago, when I was moderating panels here at the festival, I had the funny experience of noticing that many of the questions ended up being about the media's coverage of a subject rather than about the subject itself. And as the moderator of the panel, I had to try to gently steer the conversation back toward discussion of the subject itself rather than discussion of the media. Tonight, I'm happy to say I won't have to do that. We have a full hour to talk just about the media. I'm looking forward to hearing Elliot's questions and then also to hearing your questions as well. And I always welcome feedback by email. My email is leonhart at nytimes.com. The main questions I want to address tonight are these. What are the biggest problems with American journalism? What are its biggest strengths? And what can be, can be done to maintain and build on those strengths while also addressing the problems? I'm going to start with the good news because it's probably the more controversial part of my remarks. By now, you've surely heard the other side of the story, the lamentations about the state of American journalism that journalism is a hopelessly biased echo chamber in which publications are writing only what their audiences want to hear, that clickbait dominates with listicles and dumbed-down explainers and pet slideshows crowding out in-depth work, that fake news, and by that I mean the actual fake news of the Pope-endorsed Donald Trump variety, has become as credible as real news, that the good old days of shoe leather reporting are fading. Well, this story is more wrong than it is right. I think American journalism is better today than it has ever been, and I hope to persuade you of that tonight as well. To be clear, journalism also faces serious challenges. The nostalgic narrative has some truth to it. The business model of journalism is changing rapidly in ways that threaten some truly valuable parts of the industry, particularly local news organizations, which play a vital role in our society by holding school boards and city councils and judges accountable. And yes, the fake news problem is a real problem. The lack of faith that many Americans have in the mainstream media is serious. And I'll get to that in a little bit. But it's important not to confuse the challenges and the troubles out there with the full picture. The reason that journalism matters, the reason that it's different from any other business, that it's different from, say, the horse and buggy business, is that it plays a crucial role in our democracy. It helps to keep citizens informed about the world. It gives them information on which they can act as voters, employees, investors, or simply human beings who need to make decisions every day about how to spend their money, or how to eat, or how to sleep, or how to work, or how to play. By most of these standards, journalism in 2017 is stronger than it was in 2010 or 2000 or those supposedly good old days of 1950 and 1960. It's better for readers. It's also more fun to practice. There are three main reasons to believe that's the case. 
The first is that journalism is more accurate than it used to be, which is not to say that it's perfectly accurate, but it is more accurate. To put it in terms that an economist might use, the market for truth is more liquid than it used to be. On the screen now, or in a second, you see an excerpt of a story that appeared in the Washington Post in the summer of 1994. Don't worry if you can't read it. It's a story about the behind-the-scenes efforts to build a new sports arena in downtown Washington, an arena that is known today as the Verizon Center. It's where the Washington Wizards and the Washington Capitals play. I wrote this story, as maybe you can tell from the byline. I wrote it near the end of a summer internship at the Post, and I will confess that I felt pretty good about it. The editors stripped the story across the top of the metro section. But there is a problem with this story. I'll give you a couple seconds, although I don't expect anyone to see it. The problem is that a word in this story is misspelled. And it's not just any word, it's Catherine. As in Catherine Graham. As in Catherine Graham, the longtime publisher of the Washington Post, the newspaper in which this article appeared. Catherine should have two A's and one E, not vice versa. Two A's, one E, two A's, one E. How did I learn about this mistake? I learned about it a week later, when a small item appeared in the local weekly, Washington City paper, claiming, and I quote, there is a special place in the dungeon of the Washington Post for David Leonhardt which is not exactly what you want to read when you're a summer intern trying to get hired into a full-time job. Coincidentally or otherwise, I did not get hired into a full-time job at the Washington Post. Now let's step back and imagine that I or another reporter made this mistake today. Think about how different the situation would play out. The story would go online and in all likelihood, within minutes, certainly within hours, some eagle-eyed reader would begin mocking the story and the person who wrote it. In all likelihood, the mistake would never even have appeared in the print edition of the Washington Post because it would have been caught so quickly. Now, in the big picture, I understand that spelling mistakes are mostly just embarrassing, although they are embarrassing. Apparently, three years later, I'm not totally over that one, rather than deeply important. But this particular spelling mistake highlights a larger point about the newly liquid market for truth. In the old days, when people, when readers like you, when the subjects of a story wanted to question the conclusions or the facts in a story, they didn't have many great options. They had to write a letter to the editor, which might or might not have been published, or they had to find another newspaper or magazine willing to write a different story. There's a reason for the old saw, don't get in a fight with someone who owns a printing press. Today, writers and readers are able to hash out questions in real time. Not only does this newly liquid market help readers, it makes us journalists better at our jobs. As the Nobel laureate psychologist Daniel Kahneman has written, Acquisition of skills requires a regular environment, an adequate opportunity to practice, and rapid and unequivocal feedback about the correctness of thoughts and actions. With the exception of the word unequivocal, I would argue that this entire description applies to journalism and social media today. Mistakes simply have a shorter half-life than they used to. Now, I know what you're thinking. I understand that this new reality comes with a downside. People can also promulgate falsehoods more easily than they could in the past. We have seen some of those downsides over the past couple years, and we're still figuring out how to combat them. I've been encouraged to see that Facebook and Google have started to take their own roles as information gateways more seriously and to make efforts to distinguish between fiction and truth, although there is much more still to be done here. Still, I will take today's reality, in which more people are empowered to play a role in the flow of information over the old reality. 
I believe today's is far more consistent with this country's small d democratic values. The second reason to feel good about journalism involves the tools and techniques we have for telling stories. I joined the New York Times as a reporter in 1999, literally another century ago. Um, I'm happy to report that in the last 18 years I have misspelled neither Arthur nor Sulzberger in the pages of the New York Times. Progress. The basics of reporting, writing, and editing stories, which remains the core of what the New York Times does, is largely unchanged since 1999. Nearly every other part of the process has changed radically. When my stories went into the paper in 1999, they would likely have been accompanied by one or two photos and a black and white chart or map. If you looked really closely at that chart or map, you might have noticed that Colorado was a slightly different shade than New Mexico, which meant that some measure of social well-being was a little bit better in one than in the other. Today, journalists have so many more tools at our disposal. And when they're used right, they're really powerful tools. Consider this story about how the odds of escaping poverty differ depending on where someone grows up. Gone is that little black and white map. In its place is a map that uses an IP address to figure out where the reader is reading the story and shows her or him data about the county where they are reading the story. If readers don't want to see that county, they can zoom out and see the whole country. If they want to see the county where they grew up, in Georgia or Colorado or you name it, they can zoom in there. By any definition, this is better journalism than the similar stories I was writing back at the start of the 21st century. These tools now improve stories on everything from the Philippines to Antarctica, from the opioid epidemic to electoral politics, as well as on culture and food and sports. They convey information in ways we could not have done so in the past. And readers are responding. When you look at the list over the most read stories on the Times website over any extended period, so this isn't the list that we publish on the web, this is the private information we have about what was the most read story over the last several months, last several weeks, over the entire year, you notice a few fascinating patterns. First, there are of course some articles about the great clickbait subjects of diet, pets, exercise, sex, and the greatest clickbait subject of them all, real estate. But most of the best read articles are not about those subjects. They're serious work about politics and current affairs. I find this pattern, however, the most telling. A disproportionate share of the most read articles are not actually articles. Not in the traditional sense. They are interactives like the one I just showed you. They are maps, they are photo essays, they are videos, they are Q and A's. Our new dep deputy publisher, A.G. Salzberger, likes to say that he has never, in his entire life of being identified with the Times, received as much positive public feedback as he has about our podcast, The Daily. These are often highly substantive pieces of work about serious topics. They're just not in the form around which we have traditionally organized journalism, long blocks of text. Here's one final point about the new tools of journalism. One of them isn't even new. It's just we've become to use it more often. The web has encouraged us to use the direct, clear voice of the web. And I say this lovingly because I've been a journalist essentially forever, but the old writing style, where we begin a story that in some kind of language like in a fundamental shift that augurs other fundamental shifts, and then follow that up with 40 more words before you get to the first period, that's not actually good writing. It doesn't help readers understand what's going on. And the web has pushed us to use a style of writing that makes it easier for really smart non-experts, and that is the audience of the New York Times, smart non-experts, to engage with our material more easily. I consider that to be progress. The final reason that journalism is stronger, in my mind, is simply that the market says it is. The audience for ambitious journalism is larger than it was only a short time ago. 
The number of people who read a typical big story in the Times has grown probably between 50 and 100 percent since the year 2000. Many of those readers are paying for the product, either through an online subscription or a print one. I am part of the sandwich generation of journalism. Young journalists think of me as old, appropriately so, alas. When I started working for newspapers in high school and college, my classmates and I put together papers much as people had been doing for decades, if not for more than a century. We pasted columns of text onto a printing press plate and in turn made them into physical newspapers. We had to get our hands sticky and inky. It was great. At the same time, older journalists think of me and my generation as on the other, younger side of the divide. And they're not wrong either. I got my first full-time job as a journalist in 1995, which you may recognize as the year that Netscape Navigator was released. My entire career has occurred during the digital revolution. My peers and I have always understood that our business was in the process of rapid, major change and that we have to react in order to remain relevant. My sandwich status is part of the reason that Dean Bacay, the executive editor of The Times, asked me a year and a half ago to lead the strategic review of The Times operations that Elliot alluded to. Our team consisted of stellar people from around The Times, people who taught me an enormous amount. It was a fascinating and energizing experience, and I want to spend just a couple minutes now focusing on The Times. We called our strategic review the 2020 project, meant to point the way to the New York Times of the year 2020. And we came up with a basic diagnosis, which was this. The Times has changed enormously over the past decade, and as a result is in a stronger position than virtually any of our competitors, yet we have not changed nearly enough. We still have a newsroom and a news report that does not take sufficient advantage of the new tools available today. Our work too often reflects conventions built up over many decades, when we spoke to our readers once a day, when we cultivated an aura of detachment from them, and when almost our only tool was the written word. We also still have a staff and an outlook that is not sufficiently diverse. Our ambition is not to be only a national organization, but a global one. And we need a staff and an approach that reflects our highly diverse country and world. We are still too coastal, too white, too male, too upper middle class, too American, and yes, too liberal. Let me be clear on that last point. I reject the charge that the Times and other media organizations try to protect or elect Democrats. Goodness, look at our coverage of Hillary Clinton's email or our coverage of Whitewater, whatever you think of it or look at our coverage that has helped bring down Democratic politicians like Elliot Spitzer, Bob Torricelli, and Charles Rangel. When it comes to investigation, the media is an equal opportunity pursuer. But when it comes to covering issues, religion, education, abortion, guns, and others, the media needs to do a better job questioning our assumptions and telling stories from all sides. I've heard this is a subject that interests some people, so I'm happy to pursue it further in Q&A if you want. The fundamental reason the Times needs to continue changing is that our readers' habits are changing. We must change with them, just as we changed in previous decades. If you go back and look at the New York Times of 1970 or even 1980, you'll see that it's actually very different from the New York Times of even 2000. Visually different, different story lengths, entirely different sections, and much more. Today we face an even bigger transition. We can't simply maintain our current audience if we want to maintain our unparalleled, unparalleled news gathering operation. We have to expand our audience. Here's why. What was once our largest source of revenue, print display advertising, is shrinking. To make up for its shrinkage, we need to continue expanding our subscriber base. Here's how the final report of the 2020 project, which you can see online, put it. The Times' ambitions are grand to prove there is a digital model for original, time-consuming, boots on the background, expert reporting that the world needs. We are, in the simplest terms, a subscription-first business. 
Our focus on subscribers sets us apart in crucial ways from many other media organizations. We are not trying to maximize clicks and sell low margin advertising against them. We believe that the more sound business strategy for the times is to provide journalism so strong that several million people around the world are willing to pay for it. Of course, this strategy is also deeply in tune with our longtime values. Our incentives point us toward journalistic excellence. You can read the report online if you're interested. I'm happy to tell you that the board of directors, the Ox Selzberger family, and the Times' senior leadership never shied away from institutional self-criticism during the 2020 process. They debated our recommendations with us. They accepted them, and they are now implementing them, often tweaking them and updating them and changing them along the way as they should. There really are hard choices here. If you're a close reader of the Times, you may have read recently about some of the internal debate about how many editors we should have. I believe that Dean Baquet and Joe Kahn, the managing editor, are making fundamentally the right decision to reorient our resources in other ways. The Times is still going to employ a lot of editors. I think in the current world, three edits as opposed to five or six is the right place for many stories. But there are also risks, and there are serious things to grapple with. Let me close the discussion of the Times with one chart that captures, captures the reasons for bullishness about the place. This shows you the number of people who are paying for digital-only subscriptions. It excludes all print subscribers, even though our print business remains remarkably robust. I am a print subscriber. I still like reading the print newspaper. In 2010, the Times had zero digital-only subscribers. That's when we constructed a paywall that was greeted with no small amount of skepticism. Some people, including me, thought our initial price was too high. Um, it worked out just fine. The Times, like many publications, has benefited recently from a so-called Trump bump, but I think it's noticeable that you don't actually see that much of a bump on that chart. The growth was rapid even before the Trump bump. Thanks largely to our subscribers, the Times' digital revenue isn't merely larger than that of our competitions. It's of a different order of magnitude, according to media reports that have aggregated this. More than three times larger than BuzzFeed's digital revenue, about five times the Daily Mail's, and about eight times the Washington Post's. Here's where I say thank you to you all. If you are a print subscriber, thank you. As I said, print is still a pretty great technology with some big advantages over digital, including its battery life and its very fast load times. If you are a digital subscriber, thank you just as much. All of you are the reason that the Times is able to employ more coders and more cartographers than any other news organization. You are the reason our reporters filed stories from more than 150 countries last year. You are the reasons we employ lawyers to write about the law, doctors to write about medicine, economists to write about economics, and investigative reporters to keep our government accountable. You may have heard the New York Times has had a few big scoops in the last few days. You've paid for those scoops. Thank you. I promise you, I promise you, we don't take your loyalty or our position for granted, constantly asking how we can do better, and we welcome your suggestions. In a real way, we work for you. My optimism about journalism is not limited to the Times. The Washington Post's ascent over the past few years has been a sight to behold and is a very encouraging development, no matter how much we at the Times may hate it when the Post beats us on a story. Some publications that didn't exist a quarter century ago, or even a couple years ago, Slate, Vox, Lawfare, The Ringer, and others are also doing great work. In many cases, they're doing better work than publications that have faded or gone out of business. Journalism, too, benefits from creative destruction. But there is one place, as I mentioned, where the trends have been much darker, local journalism. Local journalism, as I've said, is a vital part of democracy. And many local newspapers have not been able to persuade their readers to pay for digital subscriptions. Many have instead turned to intrusive pop-up ads and auto-playing videos, and I understand why they've done it. They need revenue but I also often despair when I go to one of their websites and find it difficult to read. I don't pretend to know the answer for local journalism. Does it involve pairing traditional journalism with more utilitarian information about schools and traffic and high school sports and the like that people might be willing to pay for? Does it involve foundation funding? Does it involve collaborative networks between local and national news organizations? I don't know. 
If you care about civic life in this country, I'd encourage you to give some thought to these issues and to get involved. Think of local journalism as something that is worthy of your brain power, your philanthropic efforts, or simply your subscription dollars. We need local journalism, and it's not yet clear how we are going to get enough of it. The one shadow that's even darker than the one looming over local journalism is my final subject. It's the mistrust shadow. Many Americans, as I'm sure you know, mistrust what they read and hear from the media. And if they don't believe what they're reading and hearing, it doesn't much matter whether journalism is better than it used to be. What can we do about the problem of mistrust? Well, we can rededicate ourselves to doing our jobs even better and to listening to criticism. We can grapple seriously with questions of bias, all kinds of bias. We can do a better job of showing our work, as my teachers used to say, for those readers who are interested, explaining how we reported a story and why we came to the conclusions that we did. We can invite readers to tell us when we have erred, and we can fix our mistakes quickly and transparently. I am intrigued that Wikipedia, whatever its imperfections, seems to be more trusted across the ideological spectrum than many mainstream media organizations are. Maybe there's a lesson there for us. But I also think it's vital not to view the media's mistrust crisis in isolation. It's not a problem that is isolated to the media. And so the solution almost certainly cannot be isolated to the media. I have one more chart to show you before we finish. It depicts Gallup's data on Americans' trust of major institutions, like the media, big business, organized labor, and the like. And if you can read it, you'll see that I've temporarily removed the names of those institutions. I'll add them back in a minute. You'll notice that every single institution on this slide was less trusted in 2016 than in 1981. The first point on the line, on the right, shows the percentage of Americans at the start of the era who had a high level of trust in the institution in 1981. The second point, where the arrow ends, shows the level in 2016. I left out a couple whose mistrust, whose trust has not declined, I'll be honest, like the military. But for the most part, as you'll see in a minute, these are really the major American institutions. Can you find the media on here? I bet you can't. It isn't the least trusted institution. That's Congress. <laughs> it isn't the institution with the biggest decline in trust since 1981. That's the medical system. The media looks a lot like every other institution on this slide. It's basically in the middle. I believe that trust has plummeted because living standards for a large segment of the American population have stagnated. The typical household's net worth is lower than it was 30 years ago. Incomes have grown sluggishly. Lifespans have stopped growing for people without college degrees who are the majority of Americans. Obesity, drug use, single parent families, and imprisonment have all soared over the last few decades. Put simply, many Americans do not enjoy a much higher standard of living than their parents did. No wonder they are frustrated. No wonder they mistrust many pillars of our society. Those pillars have failed them. Solving these problems is, of course, devilishly hard. It is the great challenge of our time. Until we find ways to address it, many of our problems, including problems that seem specific to individual parts of society, like the media, are not going away. Thank you so much for coming out in the rain to listen, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Well, that, that was terrific, and on just that last slide, there are many people, David, in this audience that you probably know. We actually have a summit going on here at the Institute on economic security, yes. and we agree with you. We think that is the greatest issue of our time. Let me just start with a question combining uh, your, your just offhand reference to scoops yes. and, your, your comment about, and your comments about trust. For anyone, or for anyone who wasn't 
hiking all day and then had their cell phone drown. Uh, <laughs> they're aware of really a rather remarkable scoop uh, in your newspaper today, uh, a jaw-dropping, perhaps historically jaw-dropping one, involving uh, emails from Donald Trump Jr. I don't think you're probably going to tell us how your paper got those emails, and of course he, he proceeded to tweet them when he knew they were going to be published. But I wonder if you could comment about what a story like that means in the context of the certain, and we've already seen some of it, response about it's just more fake news. So I actually think it's, it's in some ways, it's almost a too comfortably comforting example. But, but I'll explain why. So it is true that there are many things out there that many basic truths that large parts of the country are going to doubt, right? We've seen that play out over and over again. I still think that we need to have a basic faith that in the end, the truth has some big advantages over falsehoods. And that we still have civic institutions in our society that are not part of the opposition, that are not part of Trump, like the judiciary, that are going to play a role and put a thumb on the scale for truth. And I think this is a really interesting example because the Times has now had three straight days of scoops on this. And I am sure that there are some people who on day one or day two said, fake news, New York Times made it up. I'm sure there's some conspiracy somewhere on a website. Well, guess what? On day three, it became significant enough and detailed enough and there's enough legal jeopardy involved that Donald Trump Jr. himself released the emails. And so I do think this is a little bit of an encouraging reminder. It's not always gonna be this quick, right? The president is not gonna tomorrow say, climate change is real, right? But, but I think we need to retain a basic faith that in the long run, truth can beat falsehoods. And I actually think this is an encouraging example. Well, let's also talk a little bit more about what you alluded to, which is liberal bias. And, I, and I, I'd like you to just talk about this a bit more. Um, let's just talk about the New York Times. Yep. I mean, you're clearly left of center. Most of your fellow com columnists are left of center. There are some exceptions. Uh, I think it's probably fair to say, although I'm sure there are no you know, questionnaires to this effect, that most of your reporters are probably left of center. I would suspect that many of your reporters and many of your editors, like you, uh, are graduates of the Yale Daily News. You were editor-in-chief for the Harvard Crimson, and most of them probably come from one of the coasts. Uh, so don't the critics of the New York Times have a very good point? Yeah, they do, and that's partly, well, I think we need to engage more seriously with that. I think one of the ways in which, I'm sure you all are familiar with this distinction between the news and the opinion side, right? And I actually think that's a really interesting existential question. It, for most of American history, and in most of Europe now, they don't quite have that divide. And I don't know whether it's gonna persist in the internet age, but it has for now, and, and the Times is committed to it. Uh, I noticed this because, as you said, I am certainly left of center. I am also right of left. <laughs> and so there are a whole bunch of issues in which I'm pretty conservative, and I notice these issues, not just in the New York Times, but in the Washington Post and in other publications too. I'm pretty conservative on education. And I notice certain assumptions when I'm reading stories about education. And I realize that I'm having the experience that someone who has a different opinion about gun control than I do must have all the time on that same issue. And so I really do think that this is, there are no easy answers to this, right? We can't just go out and say, we're gonna find out what the median opinion in the country is and we're gonna write it. Because I think we should be really strong about certain things like climate change is real and it's being caused by human activity. And I don't care what the poll numbers show about how many Americans believe in that. A lot of issues are different from that. Abortion's different from that. Guns are different from that, you know? And I think on those issues, we need to look ourselves in the mirror exactly as the ways you just asked me to do and sort of say, why don't we employ more people from middle America? Why don't we employ more people with conservative backgrounds who then also will try to check their ideological beliefs at the door? Um, I, I just think it's really important. Well, what about another variant of this problem, which is that we increasingly tend to read the news or listen to the news or watch the news that we know we're gonna agree with. 
I mean, that wasn't the case when you began as a journalist, and many of us in this audience grew up listening to one of three networks or one of two national news magazines or Walter Cronkite telling us that's the way it is. Now we can read the New York Times and we can read some of the other things you referred to, or we can watch Fox News and Breitbart and the Drudge Report and inhabit different universes. So what, in terms of the future of the news, can be done about that and what it contributes to our polarization? I, I think not everybody, but I think most people on both the right and the left aspire to not just read what they agree with in their own minds. And so I think this is one of these places in which we can help people do better, whether it's Facebook or whether it's us. The Times has recently started, you may have noticed it doing this thing, Voices from the Right and the Left, right? Where you can read what people from the right and left are saying about things. And I think that basically what we should look, what we should do as the media is look for ways to bring people voices um, that they don't normally encounter. I recently hired a new assistant um, who is going to help me with the newsletter that you mentioned. And one of the reasons why I hired him was um, he had great ideas for the newsletter during the interview process. And one of his ideas was every day the newsletter should have at least one article basically from Red America. And not from like Brett Stevens, David Brooks, Republican who doesn't like Donald Trump, Red America. Right. So, you know, you... you, you I like both Brett Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, uh, let, let, you talked a little bit about the, your, the, the increase in digital uh, uh, subscriptions and how well the New York Times and the Washington Post are, are doing and, and, and opposition, how poorly many uh, local papers are doing. But what, af what happens after the Trump bump? And what happens to continue to support the business of world-class journalism? Uh, you know, you don't have classified ads anymore. You have to get subscriptions. There have always been some kinds of cross-subsidies in journalism. What are the cross-subsidies of the future so we can expect high-quality journalism uh, to continue? I think that's such an important point. I, I think, uh, obviously, I'm not a huge nostalgist, right? I think it's really important to remember that it's not like journalism itself, news gathering, was highly profitable back in the 60s and 70s. What was highly profitable was classified ads and display ads and weather and sports scores and local obituaries. And people essentially tacked onto that journalism. And so journalism has always struggled, if you read history, to find a business model. And this struggle isn't new. What's new is that we lost our old cross subsidies. And so we need to go find new ones, right? In a weird way, this is the golden age of people actually paying for journalism, right? Because that is what our subscribers are going out and paying for. I think the search for cross subsidies continues to be really important, particularly for local media, particularly for places that don't have the luxury of charging for subscriptions the way we do. H having said that, I also think that we at the New York Times are not that far from a place in which we don't have to keep growing that line forever to afford our current newsroom. We are not that far, I don't know exactly where it is, we are not that far from a point in which that, the number of digital subscribers gets large enough in which we don't need to worry about the New York Times um, being here for a very long time. Uh, there hasn't been a president who hasn't been alarmed by the media and unhappy with the media. Just talk to us a little bit more about what is different in degree or nature with what's going on now. And how, how alarmed are you by President Trump's uh, comments and attacks on, on the media? And you know, how is it different from earlier situations? And finally, given this opposition and these attacks, should the media be part of the opposition to these attacks? I'll take the last question first, no. The media should not be part of the opposition. Yes, of course there should be columnists who are saying, uh, you know, Trump is terrible or what Trump is doing is great. There, we should have that. But no, the media itself should not be part of the opposition. As I said before, we need civic institutions that don't take sides, right? We're sitting at one of them. Um, uh, we need the judiciary. We need the media. We ab American democracy absolutely needs that. So 
how to think about Trump in historical perspective. It, it, is, it is important, as you just mentioned, it's not like the media was chummy with the Obama or the Bush administration. I mean, I, I still remember the day that the Supreme Court upheld Obamacare, getting an angry phone call from someone in the administration about the tone of our headline on our story about the Supreme Court decision. To which I think I said, um, I think you have more important things to worry about and I think you should be celebrating not you know, calling me. I may have added a few other <laughs> words in there. Um, uh, so there's always been these tensions. I mean, the, you know, the, uh, the Obama administration's pursuit of leakers, um, uh, the Bush administration trying to quash New York Times stories um, about intelligence programs. I mean, I, I've had some really, in, when I was Washington Bureau Chief, I had some really tough conversations with people in national security about what we were publishing. So that those tensions have always been there. But this is fundamentally different. Um, Donald Trump has called the media the enemy of the people. Um, uh, George W. Bush has spoken out against what Donald Trump is doing. David Remnick, the editor of The New Yorker, has said it's an emergency, and I think he's right. This isn't about the media. This is about the Trump administration trying to create a monopoly on information in which they are the monopolist. Think about it. The same way they have attacked the media is the way they have attacked federal judges. It's a way they have attacked people who have devoted their lives to this country as agents in the CIA and other parts of the national security apparatus. It's the way they have attacked scientists. It's the way they have attacked one kind of person after another. Quite frankly, it's not that different from the way they've attacked voters. Um, and so, uh, to me, I find this so worrisome and chilling, even amidst, as you can tell, my natural optimism, because it is a scattershot but sustained series of attacks on any organization that is attempting to provide independent information. Uh, we're gonna go a little bit after seven o'clock because we started late, and I'm just gonna ask one more question and then please be thinking of questions for David. But just, just one other question. You, refer, you made a reference to the, the recent controversial decision of the Times to reduce the numbers or layers of editors. Why should any of us care about that, and why isn't that just sort of inside baseball for New York Times and other journalists to talk about worrying about jobs and their future? So first of all, I, in talking about this, I, I want to acknowledge that this is going to involve changes at the Times that will cause really talented people either to take buyouts or to lose their jobs. And so on the first level, it's, uh, um, I find it just personally and professionally sad. Um, uh, organizations have to change, right? We can't stay thing, but I just wanna, to wanna make that point. I also wanna say, if you know anyone looking for a good editor, some reporters of the Times are putting lists together of the great editors who will likely be leaving the place for books and things like that. These are really talented people. You're right, this is mostly inside baseball, right? Um, but I think the thing to understand is that we used to produce one version of our report every day, right? You got it in the morning. And when you're doing that, it, call, it calls, and not only that, but it, it all has to fit just right, right? It, cause, it, it calls for layers of editing and, and layers of care that the internet does not require. I wanna be clear, the internet still requires copy editing. If you read the 2020 report, we said, um, if the Times start having more copy editing mistakes than it does now, we will pay a price for that in, from our subscribers. It still calls for really smart editing. But you would be amazed to know um, how, many, how much editing sometimes goes into New York Times stories. And you know, maybe the first, the second, the third edits really are sharpening it and improving it, but the fourth and the fifth and the sixth are sometimes undoing the second and then redoing it and then undoing the third and redoing it. And it made sense for a time of print, but look, there's, we live in a world of constrained resources and there's a very direct decision. Do we want to be employing two more foreign correspondents in Africa? Do we want to be employing cartographers who could make those maps? Um, or do we have too many editors? And Joe and Dean um, have decided, and I think they're absolutely right, you can read the 2020 report for more rationale, that we need to shift our mix a little bit more. The one other thing I'll say is if you look at virtually every other publication, including real high quality publications that have been digitally native. Their ratios don't look anything like ours. We will still employ a much higher number of editors than they do. And I've now spent three minutes talking about something that I said was inside baseball, so I apologize. Uh, all right, I'm gonna go to the audience, and David can attest, even though my eyes are much older, that it's blinding up here, so we have a very hard time even seeing questions. Uh, but let, let's go, and let me start over here with, in the front row. Oh, I can recognize you. <laughs> 
Hi, David Nish Patel. We know each other. I'm here for the uh, Economic Security Summit. And um, I was thinking about your comment about how the Times, the Post, and the Atlantic now have seen an uptick in paid subscriptions. And something else I've noticed, because I this is the beat I tend to follow, is poverty, economic opportunity. I've seen an uptick in high quality coverage of those issues. I haven't cataloged it, but it certainly feels like that to me. Like I've been doing this work for 20 years, and there are more great stories than ever, some of them yours. Um, do you think those two things are related? Is there more interest in these issues? Or do you agree with it, first of all, and then what I count? Uh, like you, I can't quantify it, but I do agree with it. Um, I think there are two causes, probably. Um, uh, one is exactly what you said. I think that, we, although it's indirect, I don't think it's that we now have more resources, therefore we're doing this. I think that, look, the, the election of Donald Trump surprised a lot of people, including us in the media. And I think it caused us to ask, why didn't we see this coming? And one of the things it caused us to say is, why haven't we done a good enough job covering um, the frustration in this country, right? And the lack of opportunity for a lot of people and in a lot of places. Not just Donald Trump's election, other things as well, right? Black Lives Matter, the success of the Sanders campaign, the trust data that I put up there. And so I think that is part of it. I also think, and this is a, a, a very nerdy answer, but it's true, the quality of data and information that we have gotten over the last few years about people's paths through life is just stunningly different and better, led by um, uh, a whole bunch of researchers. The one whose work I've written the most about is Raj Chetty at Stanford. And I think that also explains some of the increase. Okay, I'm gonna need some help from the person with the microphone. A gentleman on the aisle here, and then we're gonna go in the middle of this row, if you can get a microphone there for next. Th thank you for oh, thank you for your presentation. It's very interesting. I'm I'm interested. One one area you didn't talk about that I'm concerned in terms of the future of news, uh, the important role that uh, media and journalism play in society, is that over the last several years we see that there's a greater concentration of me of ownership and control of media outlets in fewer and fewer hands. Oftentimes in hands that do have a very specific agenda. And I'm curious as to your thoughts or insights into uh, how you think that impacts the future of news. I, I think that's an important question. Thank you for calling attention to it since I did not mention it. I also find it worrisome. I mean, look, concentration of ownership, concentration of market power is problematic all over the place, right? It's interesting to think the, the, uh, the Obama administration underestimated the problem of concentration of market power in the implementation of Obamacare and explain, it explains some of the problems in there. It is certainly a problem in the media. One of the ways that I think about it is, um, look, I, I can't be objective in talking about the Salzburger Ox family, um, um, but boy, a major company would not have made the investments that they have made in journalism. And yes, over the long term, that has benefited the New York Times enormously. But in the short term, it often has not. And so the reason the New York Times is the New York Times is because we are not owned by some giant corporation that was trying to figure out how to maximize profits this year or next year or even the year after. Um, so I'm very worried about it. I think it's something that deserves attention from, from an antitrust perspective, from all kinds of perspective. Um, the more optimistic the silver lining is there are also a lot of new entrants um, and they aren't always um, owned by these big players um, particularly at the beginning and so I do think we're in a time where there's enough flux right now um, while I do remain quite worried about it um, I think that we have enough new players coming in that we should be able to get a variety of voices okay if we can get a microphone in the f I yeah. f right okay fine great thank you thank you uh, Elliot your questions were terrific and you touched on this a bit but there was a time when Lyndon Johnson, I think, was quoted as saying, if I lose Walter Cronkite, I lose the Vietnam War. And of course, eventually he did lose both Cronkite and the war. The, the trust that Cronkite had may now be largely lodged in the New York Times. You did a column, David, uh, which I just happened to bring. It actually wasn't a column, it's a whole page. Thank you. June, June 25th, Trump's lies, and in very small print, I don't know how many there are. You probably know how many there are on this page. But the question is about consequence. Um, Johnson gave up on the war when the, the people led by Cronkite turned against it. If Cronkite had come up with two or three of these lies, it would have been a major issue. You came up with several hundred. Uh, what's the consequence of that? And how do you see that having changed and changing in the future? Um, thank you. 
first of all, I'm going to make a very brief side point, which is whenever you hear people worry about the blurring of lines between news and opinion, it's important to remember that Walter Cronkite story. Walter Cronkite blurred the lines between news and opinion. You couldn't lose Walter Cronkite if he was just delivering straight news. Um, John Dickerson is really interesting on this issue. Um, uh, so, um, but yes, look, there is no there is no version of Walter Cronkite in American society today, and that has some big downsides, which means that institutions have less power than they used to. It means Donald Trump was able to basically bust the norms in virtually every part of this process, uh, the Republican nominating process, the election itself, and now as president. Um, it has some really, really big downsides. Look, it also has some upsides. I mean, the, in those old days where a few institutions commanded these, these incredible voices, those were not diverse institutions or voices, and a lot of people were shut out from them. Um, whether it's good or whether it's bad, it's gone. Uh, and so there is no kind of putting that back together. And I think the question instead becomes, how do we use the same tools that have dispersed power and created grassroots power in many ways to have the effects that losing Walter Cronkite could have back then? Do we have a question over on this side? Yes, over here. Thank you. You talked a little bit about antitrust and there was just an article about the Congress potentially acting to allow traditional media to stand together and negotiate with new social media outlets. Do you have any comment on that? So this is, I mean, I'm sure it appeared in multiple places, but if you're interested in it, Jim Rutenberg's media column in the Times yesterday uh, addressed exactly this issue. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, um, so I, I don't really know what the legal issues are of this. But I do think that it is really important to start to think of Facebook and Google in a, 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 as powers unlike anything else. Facebook and Google are now getting all, more than 100%, of digital advertising, new digital advertising. So it's not just that display advertising is going away, it's that all of the revenue from the new digital advertising, not, it's not replacing the old one, but, but it's all going on net to Facebook and Google, and none of it is going to the Denver Post or the New York Times or you name it. And so I think it's really important. The antitrust problem now is not newspapers talking to each other. The antitrust problem now is the role of Facebook and Google. I'm big fans of Facebook and Google, but there are real antitrust issues around them and around the power they have, and responsibility comes with that power. Campbell Brown was here at the Ideas Festival talking about this. I'm glad to see that Facebook is starting to engage a little bit more with this issue, but I also think they still have a ways to go. Uh, here, Ick, we have the microphone in the front row, please, and then and then back here. I'm sorry. Oh, actually, actually, go ahead if you've got the microphone. But then we're coming right back to the front row. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, it's great to have you here again. Um, we've discussed uh, concerns uh, about fake news, and in response, in various discussions, we've talked about the UK having the BBC and the government providing objective news, however you define that. Um, w one might argue that that's what we could use NPR for, um, except NPR is not going to get funded uh, by the federal government, certain, certainly not now. Um, and, uh, and so the question is, what's the alternative? And I just wonder whether or not you take an organization like C-SPAN, which is supported by certain networks, et cetera. Can the, uh, in your mind, is it worthwhile to have uh, companies in this country um, support a C-SPAN so that we can, on a daily basis, get the equivalent of um, uh, the um, uh, straightforward news without the falsehoods in response to those falsehoods? So the, the, the British system, comes with some big downsides for journalists, right? When, when I talked about people in the national security establishment telling me that we at the New York Times shouldn't publish something or telling my bosses, we had the ability to say no. And we sometimes said no and we sometimes said yes. In Britain, journalists don't have that ability. The government tells you not to publish, you don't publish. And so I'll still, I'm enough of a Jeffersonian, I'll still take our system. I'd rather not have the government having too big a role, in part because 
you don't never know which way the government's going to go, right? Um, and and I think it's just the American tradition to kind of have this be free and in the private sector. I, I like the C-SPAN idea. I think that I think that we want. Um, we do want people to be able to have access to all kinds of information, both the raw feed from Congress as well as a variety of things. The good news is this all, is all getting cheaper. So the problem is not so much producing it. The problem is what do people see? And I think that's why Facebook is so important because even if it existed, if no one's seeing it, it wouldn't matter so much. And so I really think the most important tunnel to think about right now is Facebook. And the question is, what are people seeing through Facebook? Um, and that matters more than, than anything else. Front row. Great. Thanks, gents. Um, if local media is dying and outlets like the New York Times, as you mentioned, are focused more on the educated but non-expert population, who's really focusing on everyone else and bringing honest, balanced news to them? And if no one, then shouldn't the New York Times, as the most more profitable outlet that's kind of figured out this whole content versus profit line, be focused on them since they're electing people like our president. Sadly, we're not that profitable. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, look, the New York, the, I, think there, I think you've hit on something really important here, right? Which is there is what is the right strategy for any individual organization and what does our country need? The second question is more important than the first question. The New York Times, for better or worse, has always been, has never been a mass publication. I grew up in New York. The newspaper with the biggest circulation in New York when I was growing up wasn't the New York Times and it wasn't close. It was the New York Daily News, right? And so I think that you're hitting on something really important. As much as I love the New York Times, I don't think we're the answer to it. I worry that we would get mission creep and I worry that we wouldn't necessarily appeal to all those folks and that we would essentially spread ourselves too thin. Um, there's nothing that's stopping them from coming to us now and we market ourselves all over the place. So I think you're hitting on something really important, which is what is a model for news that can appeal to the vast parts of this country who are hungry for it? Whatever you think of Fox News, Fox News came up with a strategy that worked for appealing to large numbers of those consumers. And I'd like to see other people try using a somewhat different model than Roger Ailes' preferred model. Uh, uh, there's a question in the far back. You mentioned that the mainstream media and the mainstream newspapers did not see Trump's uh, victory coming. And I'm just wondering, if you had concentrated on what was happening in the states all over the country, little by little by little, they were becoming more red. And that's because the people felt they had more power in the states. And so what I'm wondering is, did you take your eye off the ball on what was happening in those states? And maybe that's one of the reasons. Yes, we did. I mean, as you, as you noted, I forget what the number is. How many seats in state legislatures did Democrats lose over the eight Obama years? 900, I think, or something like that. Um, as Ron Brownstein of The Atlantic, who's here a lot, has pointed out, now that's normal for a party to hemorrhage seats when they have a two-term president, um, although those losses were somewhat larger than normal. They weren't radically larger than normal. Um, we did take our eye off the ball, and lots of folks did. I don't think there's a simple answer for how we could have seen Trump's election coming. The state-based polls also showed Hillary winning. I don't think there was a single poll in Pennsylvania that showed him ahead. Um, not only that, but Donald Trump's campaign thought they were going to lose. I mean, there's a really remarkable interview with Kellyanne Conway at about 8 o'clock on election night on NBC, where anyone who's followed politics knows she thinks she's losing. I remember watching it live. Um, and so we messed up. Let's be clear. Um, but given that, uh, not nobody, but there is no, there is basically no major segment of society that saw this coming, the majority of it or anywhere near. And so while I think there are real lessons to learn, I wish I saw something that if only we listened to this kind of person, we would have seen this coming. I think the best we can do now is try to do better in the future. And w time for one last question here, please. Hi, thanks so much for the panel. Uh, as a recovering journalist, I was so pleased to um, hear your optimism about the future and the business model. 
Um, and it makes me wonder what you think about the ProPublicas of the world and other nonprofit models that were developed, particularly in that in-between time, say 10 years ago, as pe folks were looking for that next business model. Do you think there's still a place or a need for those kind of outlets? Uh, or is the New York Times, the Washington Post, et cetera, going to be able to sort of cover that? No, I'm thrilled about ProPublica, and I do think there's a need for those models. Look, I think there's a need for all kinds of models, right? I mean, I would love to see someone start a ProPublica for local journalism in a place where it really looked like it would work. Some people are playing around with those ideas. Um, uh, David Rousseau, who's a friend of mine who works at the Kaiser Family Foundation, is thinking a lot about that. Um, uh, we want lots and lots of business models for journalism, right? Because what is journalism? It is information about our democracy. So I really hope and think the New York Times subscriber model will succeed. I also hope that Vox's model, which is to build a big audience and sell advertising against it, I hope that succeeds as well. And I hope these foundation models succeed. And I hope two or three other ideas that I'm not smart enough to think about succeed as well because democracy needs lots of forms of information and it certainly needs much more than just the New York Times. And we want to thank David Leonhardt very, very much for being here today. Thank you.